now and uh, start presenting this project. I will, um, here you see <clears throat> a nice picture in Oslo, I hope. Yeah. One of, one of the pilots. Um, our agenda is like this. Uh, a very short general pre uh, presentation by me now, and then I will give the word to Arvind Subin from Te uh, Technical University of Delft who will speak about the European pilots with this kind of autonomous buses or AV shuttles, as we call them for short. And then we will, I will present uh, field survey results from the three Norwegian pilots. Uh, we will have a break around 10 o'clock to uh, fill our coffees and stretch our legs, perhaps. And then uh, Carl uh, Jonsson from Lund University will present um, video analysis of interaction with cars and these AV shuttles. And then Tim De Chainek, on behalf of VS Institute in Belgium, will present uh, uh, similar analysis of interactions with vulnerable road users, that is mainly cyclists and uh, pedestrians. And then we will have another short break. And after that, uh, around 10 to 11, according to the schedule, we will have um, presentations of, very short presentations of how these um, public transport companies uh, view the future of autonomous public transport. Uh, and to, to make this a bit um, interactive in a way, we have prepared four questions for you at the end so that you can answer about the, the future of these autonomous public transport things. and. Uh, and we will look at that and uh, have some concluding remarks. So that is the agenda. And then I will just briefly present the autobus project for you. Uh, our research question has been, how do other road users interact with these self-driving buses? And you see the pictures on the, on the side, there are three pilots. Uh, the on the top is from Furus in Rogaland, and then we have the yellow one in Kongsberg and the red one in Oslo. And as I've already said, actually, we have video observations and we have field interviews. And we have these three test routes. And we have a very nice international research consortium, uh, leading by TOI, the Institute of Transport Economics but also with the Technical University of Delft, Lund University from Sweden, VS Institute from Belgium, and also Applied Autonomy in Norway and the University of Southeast Norway on board. Um, this is funded mainly by the Research Council of Norway, and, but also with co-funding from the Norwegian Public Roads Administration and the public transport companies, Rute de Kolobus and Buskeru County, as it says, now it's Viking County, but it was Buskeru County. Uh, it started in 2018, and this is the final event. So the, the project ends now, and we will, of course, publish these results in journal papers that are under preparation. If you need more info, you can go to this web page. Quickly about the location. This is a map of Europe, as you can see, and Norway and Sweden are on the top. And our pilots are located in Oslo, Kongsberg and Stavanger in the south, south of Norway. So this is just a brief introduction. And uh, I will now give the floor or the word perhaps to Irene Subin from Delft, who will tell us a little bit of uh, the European pilots, and then we will come back to these Norwegian pilots uh, after her presentation. Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay. You can see now, right? Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, so, well, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Irene Sprint, and I'm pleased to present um, today in behalf of Professor Marianne Hagensicker, who couldn't be here today. 
um, the findings of our inventory of pilots of automated buses in Europe. So I will start with a very short introduction of myself. Um, so I come from Trieste, this uh, border town uh, in the northeastern part of Italy, uh, where I studied civil engineering. Um, after graduation, I worked in a company as a junior structural engineer, uh, but then I decided to follow my passion for transport and I moved to Delft, where I studied transport infrastructure and logistic, and I graduated in 2019 and uh, under the supervision of Professor Bart van Allen, you can see in the picture here. Um, and after that, I joined the Smart Public Transport Lab as a PhD candidate, uh, and I work on driverless shuttles. So yeah, as I said, my project is about uh, driverless shuttles, so automated shuttles as access and egress mode of main public transport systems. And I structured my research in three phases. Uh, first, literature review, focusing on uh, existing pilots, uh, behavioral aspects, and integration strategies. Then I have the scenario formulation and for uh, future use of driverless shuttles. And then the subsequent simulation of these uh, scenarios, looking into um, performance indicators of different infrastructure designs, operational strategies, and types of supervision. Um, currently, I started the third phase, the scenario simulation. Um, so this Autobus project fits perfectly the first phase of, of the research, of my research, the review of existing pilots indeed. So as Torka mentioned, uh, this Autobus project is a set of studies that aim to bring automated buses on public roads. And as you'll see in the course of this webinar, uh, it touches upon passenger experience, interactions with other road users, surveys and real life observation, ob observations. Um, the project I took part in was the inventory of, of existing pilots, and it aimed to provide a complete overview of the current state of the art on automated minibuses in Europe. Um, so, well, let's dive into the methodology. The first criterion was to look for pilots that use driverless shuttles operating on public roads uh, with a mixed traffic configuration or on private roads. So in this case, um, demos and showcases operating in optimal conditions were excluded um, because we thought that uh, they would not give a realistic view of long-term implementation of the, of the vehicles. Uh, the vehicle type was narrowed down to minibuses capable to transport people as public transportation. So the ones that you can see here in the picture. Um, so these uh, vehicles have a low operating speed between 15 and 25 kilometers per hour, a small passenger capacity up to around 12 passenger, and have a automation level four or hopefully five in the future. So they're capable of driverless operations. They don't have any user interfaces. Um, there's no driver engagement, so there's no steering wheel, and they have a limited operational design domain. Um, this research was conducted between January and March 2019, and then again between November and um, uh, January 2020. Um, we followed a stepwise methodology, and uh, the first step was to consult as many online sources as possible. Um, you can see here six main references uh, that were mostly consulted. Uh, we have a book, um, an extensive, extensive uh, review journal articles, uh, online inventories, a blog, two project websites, and two company websites. So based on, on that, we conducted then a structure review uh, through the snowballing technique using the searching criteria previously defined. Um, many technical reports were written in the language of the country with the, where the pilot took place. And in, in our case, it was, we use uh, the languages English, Dutch, French, Norwegian, Italian, Spanish, and German. And of course, the search was uh, limited to European countries. Um, ultimately, we used our personal network, gaining knowledge through conferences, project meetings, and workshops, and uh, interviews. So um, let's go to the results. So uh, according to our uh, searching criteria, the inventory shows that uh, we have, uh, by, by uh, the time we finished the research, a total amount of 118 pilots, 
um, that were carried out between 2004 and 2019, with a steep increase uh, starting from 2016. As you can see, we went from eight to 18 pilots. Um, and 18 countries were involved in these pilots, uh, with France, Germany, and uh, Norway leading the way, with a total of uh, 33, 12, and nine pilots, respectively. And two brands were, um, two brands resulted to be the most used for these 118 pilots. 30% um, were performed using the Navia Arma vehicle from the Navia company. And we have 49% that were performed using the EZ10 vehicle from the Easy Mile company. And then we have other 21% that were performed using different vehicle brands, like the GRT vehicle from the company to get there, the Millapod uh, from the Miller Group, and the Gacha Muji by the Sensible 4. Company. Um, the capacity of this. Uh, of the vehicle used in these pilots uh, ranges from four seated passengers to uh, 20 passengers, standing and sitting, uh, always including the steward on board. Um, the distribution shows that uh, the vast majority of these pilots has maximum capacity between eight and 12 passengers, uh, which is in line with the most used type of vehicles that I previously explained. Um, again, also the average operational speed is very low ranging uh, from six to 30 kilometers per hour, um, with the vast majority of vehicles having an operational speed between 11 and 16 kilometers per hour. And again, in line with the most type of vehicle that were used in these pilots that I previously, previously showed. Um, the average road length goes from a few hundred meters to more than five kilometers with the highest number of pilots ranging from one kilometer to 1.5 kilometer. And uh, this reflects the main purpose for which these pilots were created, which is to serve the first and last mile of multimodal trips or to drive around private business areas or educational facilities. Um, the pilot duration was not easy to assess since many pilots do not report the exact start and ending date or do not report any date at all. Um, so from the uh, information obtained, it was noticed that the vast majority of pilots last less than six months, with only a few cases running uh, up to uh, three years. Okay, the, the vast majority of pilots was conducted on existing infrastructure with a mixed infrastructure environment. Uh, and most of the time the vehicle shared the bicycle lane with other cyclists. So they put the vehicle running on the, on the bike lanes. Um, so the most common infrastructural changes uh, were therefore of minor impact, such as uh, road markings, uh, adding warning signs, signs uh, the installation of uh, vehicle to everything equipment and the temporary platform for the vehicle stops. Um, then, yes, uh, application cases included uh, first and last mile transport solutions, uh, like I said, uh, for major uh, transport stops, university campuses, business districts, leisure facilities, airports, parking facilities, and city centers. Um, then, yeah, we can conclude with uh, some conclusion and recommendations. So, when researching all these pilots, uh, one of the main problems we encountered was the lack of proper documentation for each of these pilots. So only 33% of these uh, 118 pilots had a detailed documentation and mostly with technical reports, so no um, uh, published research. Indeed, only 12% have uh, published in review research conducted. Uh, moreover, many pilots did not mention a clear ending date, uh, making it difficult to draw a precise timeline. So our recommendation here uh, is to conduct proper research, gathering the relevant information and start um, some sort of knowledge share of this information uh, and perhaps conduct new research on existing pilots so that they uh, don't end up remaining just uh, mere demonstrations, but they can move forward to uh, actual operation. Then a uh, second point of attention is that uh, most pilots are in closed environments 
to test their capabilities. Uh, the problem with these settings is that they don't represent real life situations with real demand. So our recommendations here would be to shift these pilots to larger and denser areas to serve actual transit lines. So where uh, there is actual demand for it. So they can move again from experimental to long-term development. And then a last conclusion uh, was that despite few exceptions, almost all the pilots required a steward on board due to policies and legislations. Um, so, but cost analysis show that uh, vehicle automation technologies bring substantial uh, cost savings, which uh, are achievable only if all human components are discarded. So our recommendation here would be to create scenarios in which the steward is not present on board and conduct cost analysis on these new business models. Thank you for your attention. Um, well, I'm available if you have any questions. And if you're interested in my research, uh, send me an email or contact me on LinkedIn. So if anyone has a question for um, Irene, you can use the chat function uh, down below uh, and you can write a question or your name. I have a, I have a question for Irene or Irene. I don't Irene. Know. Irene, yeah. yeah. Uh, we saw this uh, quite steep increase in the number of pilots over time from 2016, I think it was increasing, you said. Yes, yes. Do you, uh, do you know anything? Uh, are they still increasing or is it... Uh, or is it so I think, yeah, I think in the last year they did not increase uh, no. because of this COVID situation. But um, I, we, we were also talking about that because we saw that um, it was, we also included the 2021, so what they were expected to be in 2021, and the, and the curve was increasing still, but mm -hmm. uh, it was misleading because um, the 2021 included also the one that were not already um, running, but also the ones that were running before and still running in 2021. So yeah, mm -hmm. th there was a, a um, continuous increase, yes, but uh, we don't know exactly. No, and you don't it know does. the end, end points for certain, many of them. Sorry. Maybe some, maybe some of those in 2021 has actually ended or, yeah. Uh, yeah. Exactly, or didn't even start because of the, of the COVID. Yeah. Okay, there's some, some questions in the chat here. Um, uh, do you have an idea about the very short duration of this pilots? Uh, well, no, as I mentioned, uh, it was really difficult to assess the duration of the pilots because most of them were just, and there was no uh, proper research about it. So we had to rely on uh, interviews and workshops and, and, and websites, which uh, most of them are not really um, reliable. So yeah. we just, uh, we saw that some of them were just running for a couple of weeks, so it was a really just a demonstration. So if we, we suppose that if the duration was less than two weeks, it was really just a demonstration to show the technology to the public. Okay. There is another one, yeah? teleoperation might yeah, be- Yeah, teleoperation, yes. Uh, yeah. This is what I'm uh, looking into in my, in my PhD research. So, to have one operator in, for instance, a control room that can uh, check, not properly operate because uh, it's, it's automated, but can check that everything goes well uh, in maybe, let's say, two or three shuttles. So we don't have to have one person in each vehicle. Hmm. Uh, you have a question? You can uh, ask your question. <laughs> All right, thanks. Uh, good presentation, by the way. Um, you were stating that uh, uh, the, the vehicles were, uh, were without uh, operator uh, due to legislation. Uh, what's your uh, background for stating that? Um, uh, what did you find some uh, clear re um, information or is it an assumption? Because we in the router, we experienced that the vehicles aren't ready for for uh, autonomous driving without uh, a safety driver, rather Sorry. than legislation. Are or aren't? I, I didn't catch. Are ready for? Uh, are we not, we are, not. Are, the, are not ready for the uh, for, okay. for operation um, without. Uh, 
Well, we uh, in the Netherlands there is uh, an operative shuttle without stewards. Uh, they're trying to yes to to operate it without. But I have to say that uh, in my part in this research was I did not conduct the whole research, so we had another person looking into that. Mm -hmm. So probably I'm not the best person here to answer this question. But uh, yeah, it was mostly because uh, I, I yeah I think I'm not I don't have the background to answer this question. Sorry. <laughs> oh, but it's a good point, Lashkin, you know, that uh, it's not mature enough to do it without. For many of these pilots. Also yeah. because the role of the steward is to besides check um, that the passengers are okay with the yeah. system because it's new and also I, I read some cases where the passengers the, the steward had the go no go decision so at intersections they uh, mm -hmm. said okay we can go or no we have to stop so in that case it's definitely a technical uh, requirement to have uh, a steward on board. But yeah, we will we will come back to that because we will show you uh, that uh, this <laughs> this is okay. uh, many times with these uh, buses that they uh, they certainly stop and then you have to have a steward uh, start mm. again. Okay. Um, Should I, uh, yeah, so someone. Uh, okay. Let's see. The um, yeah, commercially focused. Yes, definitely. Most of the, as I said, most of the pilots were really just um, showcases. So, to, and well, that's a personal uh, sentiment that I share. Yes. Uh, so I'm not speaking on behalf of, <laughs> of everyone, but uh, I noticed yes, that um, sometimes the the yeah pilots were just to kind of show off that uh, we have the vehicles to do that, and and there might be a future without um, drivers. Mm. So, but that would be interesting to, you know, move forward this, this pilots and actually show that it's really possible. It's not just yeah. a futuristic idea. Okay, my colleague Aslak has a, has a question for you. Have you thought about publishing some kind of guideline or recommendation for how to report results from such trials? Might be useful. Oh, that would be very useful uh, because also what we discussed in, in our team was that there might be a pilot that show that um, study something, but there's no knowledge share. So it would be nice indeed to have a guideline for uh, for how to uh, conduct and structure research. Now it's basic. It's mainly about uh, passenger behavior, so mm -hmm. mainly about surveys and how passengers react to this system. Um, but yes, that would be really useful. There is also a question here about more information about this. Um, this has been published in in a book chapter and also a TU Delft report, as far as I remember. Yes. And it also, there was an update as well, but we don't really know what to do with that. So I think it's pending a bit, is it? Or do you know, Irena? I know that now we have a version 1.0. I don't know if that's the update you're talking about, uh, but it's on ResearchGate. You can find the latest version. Yeah. Uh, if if you type my name on ResearchGate, there is the last version of our report. It's it's uh, so it has all the results I showed, and also the table. We have a very very long table with all the 118 uh, pilots, and then you can check. Um, for each pilot, uh, the duration, the seat capacity, uh, the type of infrastructure, the type of uh, infrastructural changes, and whether or not there was uh, research conducted. And, and there's also the link to the research. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, recommended to look into FESTA methodology. Okay, that's a good okay. comment. I'll yeah. Write it down. Thank you. Okay. But then it seems that there are no more questions uh, at the moment. So perhaps you should just uh, proceed to uh, to my presentation then. Um, let me see now if uh, share screen. Uh, 
Can you see my screen now? Yes. Yeah, great. Okay, uh, we will now tell you a little bit about this, um, these pilots that we have going in Norway. And, um, and before I go into the uh, field survey results, I will just give you a brief uh, introduction about our theoretical background and research question for this uh, project. And uh, very much of the pilots that have been uh, <clears throat> Uh, been studied has uh, had the focus about user acceptance, and there has been used different types of uh, models and theories about this, about acceptance and trust in technology. You have something called the technology acceptance model, and then the unified theory acceptance and use of technology. And we've also used slightly some of those questions. And then there has been quite a lot of focus on acceptance of shared transport with respect to privacy, personal space, security, and also about passenger experience. Uh, our focus has been uh, slightly different and very much about the road user interaction. Here you can see the picture of uh, this uh, automated Navia bus in Oslo in a junction, T-junction. And uh, our study of these types of interaction has been very much inspired by um, this guy who was uh, publici pub publishing this article, Pedestrians, Autonomous Vehicles and Cities, in 2016, Adam Ball, Adam Ball. And, uh, and his point was really that um, because these uh, autonomous vehicles are so defensively and and uh, uh, don't take any chances and they stop if there is a conflict, et cetera. When, when this is known for people, people will take advantage of that and that will seriously uh, obstruct these vehicles ability to, to proceed in traffic or to, to get ahead. So, and this, he used a game theoretic approach and I will just very quickly show you the basic yeah. traffic game or crossroads game uh, using these two vehicles and we can call them A and B. And this is a very simple model and uh, they can they have two options really. They can drive or they can stop in this situation. Now, if both of them drive, um, they will receive this outcome, uh, which is uh, uh, with the figure one, which is, uh, the poorest outcome for them, they crash, which is of course a very poor outcome. So they will avoid to crash, of course, and but if both stops, if both stop, they will receive uh, this outcome, giving two to each. The number in the in the left side is the is the payoff to or outcome for A, and the number in the right is the payoff to B. And of course, if both stop. Um, it's a very poor outcome as well because then they haven't solved the situation and they have to negotiate negotiate again. So for A, he if he knows that B is going to drive, he will of course stop. So we will receive this uh, payoff of three instead of one. But if he knows that B will stop, he will of course drive, and that will realize the best outcome for A that he drives and B stops. And the similar is, of course, the case for B. So there are two, what we call equilibrium points or solutions in this game. It's either that I drive, A drives and B stops or the opposite, that B drives and A stops. Now, the problem is, of course, to, to agree upon which of these two solutions that are going to be uh, materialized. And if one of the actors can commit himself or signal very clearly that what his intentions uh, are, then it's, uh, he, can, he can in many cases force a solution upon the other. So we can present the same game in a more extensive form where we can, we can model it as A has a uh, first move advantage. So perhaps he approaches in a very, very high speed or otherwise 
gives information to B that he cannot stop in this situation, or he will not stop. And if this is a credible threat or commitment for B, then, then B has no option but to stop himself. And uh, the solution will be uh, this equilibrium, giving the best payoff to A, of course. However, the opposite also is, is true, that if A very clearly signals that he's going to stop, then of course B will drive and you will have this solution. And that is really the case with these uh, self-driving vehicles. Uh, if everyone else eventually um, are aware that they are going to stop in, in every conflict situation, uh, this will be the outcome according to this game theoretic logic. And this is something that we really wanted to, to study in this project. Um, this is nothing new, really. This, this has been going on for uh, all times when we had traffic. And I'll just give you a quote from the, from, uh, the 1930s where, uh, where um, police officers said the following about traffic. The chauffeurs drove often as rockets across streets and intersections without the slightest reduction of speed, as they only restricted themselves to give one or more bumps in the horn. So that was the case in the early 1930s in Norway, in the cities. And of course, it led to lots of crashes and uh, lots of noise, but that's another story. But the signaling and the game uh, problem has been there forever, I think. Okay, now over to the pilots. Um, the Kongsberg pilot has been going on for quite some time, and it's uh, and it was in three phases. It started in uh, the city center, this green phase, from the fifteenth of October, twenty eighteen, and then it has expanded, uh, and now it goes all the way to the to the technical park or what it's called in Kongsberg. It runs from 10 to 14, 10 to two, and that's outside the rush hour. So it doesn't really meet rush traffic. Um, we have had field service in the pedestrian street. You can see the pedestrian street here. Um, and then you can actually also see the camera post. This is a mirror vision camera, and it's um, and it's a, a mobile unit, very easy to operate. This, I think, was put up my, by my colleague Ole. By the way, we have had lots of uh, colleagues involved in this project, Aslak and Ole and Katrine and uh, also others. And uh, moving around with these cameras, for instance, I think Ole was in Kongsberg uh, many, many times. Um, so, but we have had field service in these streets and uh, four different points in time to see the development over time, how people uh, react. And then we had three video cameras operating. In Oslo, uh, there was this Navier bus. You saw the same intersection. Uh, and it was a 1.2 kilometer route. Uh, this is a uh, uh, photo from above of the route, and you can see it. This is this is the Oslo city center, very close to the, to the town hall, and they had cameras on all these five positions here. And the bus is running around along the seaside to Vipetangen and then returning. So this route started on the twentieth of May in 2019, and it was running until the 1st of November. And what's important is that this, this bus was actually running uh, also in rush hours. So partly at least from eight in the morning to eight in the afternoon or evening. I think maybe not eight in the evening all times, but still also covering rush hours. And we had four surveys. Uh, at the town hall. Uh, and five cameras, yes, I said that. And then the Furious pilot at the west, at close to Stavanger, 
And uh, this is uh, also the same uh, distance, an easy mile bus. And uh, this was the first pilot, I think, uh, in Norway. Might be one before that for many years ago, but still. Of the new pilots, this was the first. It started on 12th of June in 2018 and ran until the 30th of November. And from nine to three, also outside rush hours. Uh, this is uh, a uh, stretch of road. This is a shopping center here on the Twet Center. And we, we tried to do field service here. But the problem was that so many, so few people had actually um, experienced the bus. So it was not really uh, anything to analyze at those data. But then we had a survey to employees working in this office buildings, uh, like this one. And this is where the camera is on this. And that was uh, made by a master student, Tone Schlotzwick. Uh, and is reported in the master thesis. We had two video cameras operating in Furious. I will not go into detail about the survey results from Furious because it's, uh, the, the questions are slightly different from those we asked in Kongsburg and, uh, and Oslo. And uh, also the respondents were, were um, people working in the office buildings and not people in the streets. So, but the general, the impression from that survey is that people were quite positive to the bus, but they thought it was too slow and that they always overtook the bus if they could. But if you want to read more about it, you can see this, uh, you can consult this master thesis by Tony Schlotzwick. Okay, to the field surveys. Um, this is from Oslo and cyclists being interviewed. And we had, we did that several points in time. This is my co colleague Katrin interviewing. And we basically, we had three types of questions. We, that was, are they able to a good idea? Are they safe? And how do you interact with them? Um, for the first one, the, uh, whether they are a good idea or not, we used uh, kind of general statements that people would uh, respond to. Uh, and one was AV shuttles will become an important part of the public transport system. This was asked both in Kongsberg and Oslo and at different points in time. And I have uh, uh, some of them together to agree, neither agree nor disagree or disagree. And the first result presented here is from September 2018 in Kongsberg. And you can see that 50%, half of the respondents say that, yes, they agree this will become an important part of the public transport system. And 26% disagrees, 24% don't really know. And in April, it was like this, then in June, and then again in September. So. Basically, the, the figures are quite stable, actually, in Kongsberg when it comes to this. And also in Oslo, it's uh, <coughs> very much the same picture we get. And there's not very much uh, differences over time. So um, people tend to agree to this. Uh, they're more agreeing than not agreeing. Then we had this uh, statement, AV shuttles will be more efficient than existing forms of public transport. And again, the same types of uh, results. And here you can see that there are not that much agreement. People tend more to disagree than, than to agree. Uh, and it is also here the same, very much the same picture in, uh, in Oslo, but we're quite stable over time in uh, Kongsberg, whereas it's a slight increase in the in the proportion of disagree over time in Oslo from June to September. You can see it's increasing from 33% to 44%. Uh, 
And then we got more personal and asked them more about their own uh, views. And uh, the statement was, Avi shuttles will be better than my existing forms of travel. And uh, again, the same results. Uh, but now you can see that uh, people tend to disagree even more. And that's not surprising, really. Um, and also in Oslo. And here again, you can see there is a this is after people have had experience with the uh, autonomous bus in both in Kongsberg and Oslo. And, uh, and it's not, it's the proportion disagreeing to the statement is actually increasing. So next question or next, next item was, are they safe? This is from Kongsberg. <laughs> we drove in the winter time and you can see these are a lot of kids uh, very, interested in the bus. Um, we asked different types of questions about safety. And uh, one was on a scale from one to five, where safe is one and unsafe is five. How do you rate the uh, AV shuttle? And the results are <coughs> quite positive with respect to safety. Um, it's very stable around two. And on a scale from one to five, two is, it should be quite, they consider it to be quite safe. There is an outline also in, uh, in uh, April 2019, 2.8, but that is be before the bus was actually started running, it started running in May. So people haven't really had experience with the bus at this point. And the development is quite uh, uh, positive actually. And then we ask them a little bit more directly about um, the uh, situations in the street. And uh, one statement they should uh, respond to was, I'm not sure that the Avery shuttle will stop. This is very uh, vital in a way. And again, we have, now we only have results after people have had experience with it. And we have also now, differentiated between pedestrians and cyclists, both in, in Oslo and Kongsberg. And uh, a little bit of a problematic side of this is that in, in Kongsberg, the cyclists were not that many, so we couldn't divide them on, uh, on periods. And the same problem we had in Oslo, we didn't have many pedestrians as respondents, so we couldn't divide them over periods either. But we have, uh, development over time for pedestrians in Kongsberg and cyclists in Oslo. So I'm not sure the AV shuttle will stop. Well, in April 2019, 70% of pedestrians in Kongsberg said they disagreed to this. So they were quite certain that the AV shuttle would stop if necessary. And the proportion is quite high throughout. In Oslo also, 80% of pedestrians say they are quite certain maybe the shuffle will stop. Uh, among cyclists, it's, uh, it's very similar to, to the results in Kongsberg, but um, there is a tendency uh, that over time, people tend to agree somewhat more to this, especially in Oslo cyclists. Then we asked about interaction and what they did when they meet the bus in the streets. And one statement was this, I wait for the AV shuttle before crossing. And again, uh, divided by Kongsberg and Oslo and pedestrians and cyclists over time. These are the pedestrian answers in Kongsberg and half of them agree that they wait for the shuttle before crossing. Cyclists in Kongsberg are even more polite and kind towards the AV shuttle. In Oslo, it's uh, very similar among pedestrians, but we see it's a big difference for cyclists. And uh, one important reason for this is that um, uh, much of the cycle traffic is uh, along the same way as the, as the shuttle, and not very often they don't need to cross really that much the path. But what's also interesting is that the, the disagree, the proportion disagreeing to this is, is actually increasing in Oslo. 
And I know the shuttle will stop, so I cross before it. Similar results. People in Kongsberg are kind to the bus. They stop. They don't. They don't cross before the bus. And the same is very much the case for pedestrians in Oslo. And again, there is a slight tendency that cyclists in Oslo are being less polite and kind towards the bus over time. We ask also on a scale from never to, to 10 um, to the cyclists. Uh, this, the question was really uh, out of 10 situations where, the, where you ride the, um, when you meet the bus, how often do you yield to the Avery shuttle? And this is the mean values among cyclists, and they are quite high. So cyclists, at least in uh, Kongsberg, tend to yield. Um, we can see that um, the differences here is the different situations. So the first column here is when cyclists should yield according to the rules. The second one is when uh, the AV shuttle should yield according to the traffic rules. The third is when rules are unclear. And the fourth is when they cycle over the separate crossing. But still, even when AV shuttle should yield according to the rules, traffic rules, the cyclists tend to, then they more often yield themselves than, uh, than drive be be uh, go before the bus. Uh, in Oslo, it's very different especially in September, and there is a big reduction in the, in the numbers, in the mean values of how often they yield to the shock. Uh, okay, uh, see I'm running a bit out of time perhaps, but this is, I think, my last one. And this is uh, interesting because it's uh, something that we will look into um, in more detail when we look to the videos. But they were also asked a similar question. How often do you overtake the AV shuttle when you ride behind it? And uh, in Kongsberg, the mean value from one to 10 was six. So uh, they tend to overtake more than not overtake in Kongsberg. In Oslo, it's uh, even higher among uh, around eight out of 10 situations. So at least they say that they overtake. Uh, whether they do so or not, we will see uh, more in detail afterwards. So that was my presentation for now. Um, do we have any questions? There's a comment uh, in the chat. Um, if we could, uh, let me see. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. One in five people are not sure it will stop. Yes, that's quite a, quite a high proportion. So that's actually quite interesting because the whole mechanism that we are thinking about is, is the assumption is really that people are certain that these vehicles are behaving very, uh, very defensively and all this will stop. But then uh, when one in five does not believe in that, of course, that changes the, the, the mechanism. Really. So it is quite a lot, but uh, we will come back to that also, because I think what Tim and Carl will show you that it's uh, not always the case that this bus stops when it should. But no more questions. Was it too long or too boring or too uh, complicated? To... <laughs> no, but anyway, we can come back to that if you have more questions. We will have uh, two more presentations of the results and, um, and then also the, um, after that, the break and the poll. And so if you have questions, just, uh, you can you can come with them afterwards. Should we take a break now, Hanna? Is that uh, yeah. according to schedule about? Yeah, we'll start, we'll start up again at uh, ten. Well, actually, okay. there's a question. We can have a break and then we can take the question at the same time, and uh, we'll be back at ten. But if you address the question, uh, Turkey.
Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm not aware. Yeah. How often did overtaking by cyclists cause a problem? Well, this is something that we are going to let him answer, I think, because uh, he's, he's really the one who studied this in detail. So, so I will uh, not tell you now. So, and that is for people to, to keep on and join us after the break. Yeah. Okay. Break until 10. <laughs> 